Okay, good afternoon. Today I'm delighted to be speaking with Professor Joy Chavrin, and this is the 10th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Uh, Professor Joy Chavrin works as a Jungian psychoanalyst, a psychotherapist, and art psychotherapist in private practice. She supervises experienced practitioners and trainees. And she also lectures at home and internationally on varied topics. Her research interests are reflected in her books and published articles. Welcome, Joy. Thank you, Piers. Mm, well, nice thank to be here this afternoon with you. Yeah, I feel really privileged and really honoured to be speaking with you. Um, and as I said before we began, I just want to say thank you publicly just how much your work has helped so many people. So really, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I would love to just talk a little bit about, um, at the beginning, about boarding school syndrome. So that's the topic we're going to be talking about today. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love, in your own words, if you'd like to explain what in your definition is boarding school syndrome. Right. Well, that's quite a kind of a difficult question because it's not really a definition. Um, but what happened was that so many of my colleagues were talking about people who went to boarding school in their practice, like maybe um, in supervision, peer supervision or in uh, case presentations. And in passing, people would mention that someone went to boarding school. Um, and so I was drawn to this because, well, this goes back to the first patient that drew me to, to, to realize that boarding school was an issue. Um, so, so can I go back a bit to that really? Yeah. Think, um, <laughs> that's where to start. So when um, I, I was working in private practice and I saw a number of people who'd been to boarding school, but I never really noticed. I, I didn't go to boarding school myself. My father did. He went at six. Um, there's a, I think you understand about that yeah. <laughs> from yes, your yes. podcast. Um, but um, I, it just went by in passing. You know, people would say they went to such and such a grammar school or a day school or whatever. And some people would say they went to boarding school and then you carry on. Mm. Um, and then I got a patient who... Um, who I wrote about in another book, which was called The Dying Patient in Psychotherapy. And um, I had to write about him because, well, partly because he got ill while I was working with him. And I, if I don't understand something, I find myself writing about it quite often. Um, especially if the book I needed isn't, isn't there for me as a resource. Um, and so this man came, came to see me for depression he was suicidally depressed and his um, GP referred him and immediately within two weeks he made a really dependent relationship and he told me about his boarding school experience he'd been sent at eight and it poured out of him it was like mm. he'd been waiting all his life to tell someone how awful it was mm. but there'd been nobody to listen and suddenly mm. there was someone here to listen and so I heard this and then I, as so I worked with him for quite a long time, um, <clears throat> but boarding school was the key really issue for him. I mean, earlier things had happened in his life, but he, the fact that he'd been sent to boarding school and it had been um, put to him that this, you know, is going to be a great experience. He was the only boy in the family and it was, you know, a great thing that he was going the girls weren't going to go and so when he arrived the awful shock of the aloneness of suddenly finding himself abandoned in a boarding school amongst strangers was so awful for him so this drew me to um this was in the early 1990s and this drew me to realize that this this was an issue mm -hmm. and then i started to listen more carefully to my colleagues when they talked about their clients who'd been to boarding school and I started to see that this was a kind of common theme. And um, then about two years after 
I think uh, in 1994, the, the film, The Making of Them, came mm, out. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and that was based on workshops that Nick Duffel conducted. And, of course, I didn't know that at the time. I just saw this film, and it was on Channel 4, and I just thought, oh, yes, right, this is a thing. Uh, so it was in the air, really. Mm. And so I became much more aware of it. I talked about it. I, I talked about my patients. I talked about that particular patient to my colleagues. And I started to realise this was something. And um, so then I was writing the book. And it was in it was published in 2002 originally. And I thought, just after I practically finished writing the book, I thought, Someone must have written about this because there was this program. Mm. And so in those days, you couldn't Google things. <laughs> in 2002, the scene was very different. Mm. So I couldn't Google and see, you know, if there's anything written on this. So I phoned up Karnak Books, which is the psychotherapy bookshop, which mm. probably you know that. Um, and I said, has someone written about the, the, how awful boarding school is? And they pointed me to Nick Duffel's book, The Making of Them. Mm. So I read that and made contact with Nick at that time. And so then we started a collaboration on working together on um, <clears throat> uh, particular workshops for training uh, psychotherapists to work with ex-boarders. Mm. So it's funny because it was like Nick had been doing this since 1990. And mm. it was 1990 that I was working with this man as well. But it was so it was sort of coming in the air. And of course, Nick was a pioneer in this, you know, he's, he, mm. um, because he was talking from the heart from himself and yeah. he wrote that book from himself. So, um, but I had more and more patients who seemed to have this pattern of, um, of depression or they, they'd be referred for a lot of different reasons, but the, um, the common thing that started to be recognised was it, it was that there was a pattern mm -hmm. that you know lots of people had trouble with intimacy. They had trouble with their partnerships, <coughs> their marriage or their uh, relationships. They had trouble uh, parenting their children when they became teenagers, mm -hmm. or they suddenly became totally a mess when their child reached the age that they were sent to boarding school. Yeah. They suddenly looked at their child and were horrified you know what an eight-year-old child is like because when you're an adult you don't realize because you've gradually grown through these stages you don't realize what a tiny person mm -hmm. a little eight-year-old or a six-year-old or whatever it is um is but they're really mm -hmm. small people yeah and, um so people would come at that stage so i started to recognize that there was a pattern here and so I wrote an article, um, which was published actually in 2011, um, which was um, so long time after that book was written. Um, and I thought, can I call it boarding school syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> and so I looked up what syndrome meant. And syndrome is a kind of pattern of behaviours. It's not necessarily an illness, but it can be a pattern of behaviours. and. Mm -hmm. Um, or a way of, of being that is a is recognizable so I talked to my my sister at the time she was a great um, uh, I could sound things off with her and I said can I see this and she said well I think you probably can anyway <laughs> but I took the risk of sending this article off and nobody said you can't say that so I thought oh well okay and I expected to get an awful lot of uh, kickback when it was published. I thought, mm -hmm. you know, the boarding school lobby or people would absolutely say, you can't say this. and mm -hmm. But they didn't. I Actually, what I got um, is like um, I listened to your Alex Renton interview. Mm -hmm. And like Alex, I get emails every week still mm -hmm. from people who say, thank you. <laughs> you know, I now know what's wrong with me and it's not me or it's not just me. I'm not alone with this. Um, so I was encouraged by that article, the reception of that article. And so then I 
<clears throat> the first article I published out on it was in 2004, which followed on from that other book. Mm. Um, but, sorry, is this a, getting a bit confusing? Uh, do <laughs> No, no, I, I like this. I like the, the flow. I'm, I'm following. So. Okay. So, um, so, yeah, so then I thought, I, right, I, I've got to do a bit more with this. So I decided I couldn't just go with my patients. So I interviewed people. I um, I realised that you can't do research, you can't really have a control group mm -hmm. with researching this because you can't have the same person uh, going to the boarding school and the other person not, you know, unless mm -hmm. you've got twins, I suppose. Um, but, you know, so it's very hard to do proper um, comparative research in that way. But so I just decided to speak to people and which is a form of research, and to listen to people and to listen to what they had to say. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, would listen to people at parties. I'd meet people at parties. I remember meeting a man who was quite an old man, um, probably about the age I am now, and he was saying, <clears throat> well, I went to boarding school at five, but of course I didn't get on with my mother. <laughs> well, the idea that a five-year-old can't get on with their mother, you know, we, that's the wrong way round. But a lot of people are brought up to think mm. that. You know, mm -hmm. they can't get on with their mother, or they were too naughty, or they're too bad, and so they were sent to boarding school. Mm -hmm. He was sent at five. Um, so I'd, I'd listen everywhere, and I'd talk to people, uh, friends, friends of friends, people who heard me speak somewhere and wanted to tell me their story, and all these people that were writing to me. <clears throat> and um, so there was a pattern, mm -hmm. and it's not the same for everyone. It, mm. it can be different, but it's um, there is a pattern of these kind of difficulties with relationships that I think can be recognised and put down to the experience of being sent to boarding school mm. as a young child. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Mm. I was going to just reference, you know, your book, which you kind of talk, <laughs> the research you're talking about is if people haven't read it, then please do uh, read joy's book um i'm as i've been reading through it, it's like oh wow okay great i need to ask about that or uh yeah i've just found it yeah really lovely having a different person's perspective on it um so uh, my second question was how you, how you started working in the area of boarding school syndrome but i feel you've kind of answered that uh on one level um, was there a, a kind of a feeling or just a sense of, oh, wow, this has to, this work has to be done, um, which drew you in? I think it was, yes. I mean, it was gradual, you know, because um, I wrote about, um, I'll, I'll show you this book as well, if that's all right. This Go is for it, yeah. A Dying Patient in Psychotherapy. Mm, and this mm. is a new edition of it. So this is the one that was about, a, it's a case study of the man mm. I was talking about, first of all. Mm. So that was very intense, and I wrote that book. And boarding school's a sub-theme in that book. Mm. Mm. Um, but I also published an article just after I initially published that book, and then I wrote the other boarding school article. And so it got its own momentum. And the more mm. I work I did, the more I talked to people, the more I realised this was a thing. And it got its own momentum. And the story just touched me so deeply. You know, it's just so heartbreaking to meet so many adults who don't even know they're damaged at first. Mm -hmm. You know, people come to me and they'll say they went to boarding school. And now I'll often ask them, do you remember the first day you went? Mm -hmm. Because that is a key. Mm -hmm. Most people remember it vividly. But some people don't remember it at all because they've just cut it off. They've split at that point because they, they were children and they couldn't cope emotionally mm -hmm. with the, the awfulness of it, mm -hmm. with the loneliness and the, the loss. Well, I'm telling you, you know more than I do because you know it personally. Yeah, it was an interesting thing, my story, because I, I didn't get on with my father. Uh, he was military drinker I was like right I want to go away to boarding school and I find the interesting thing about that period is that there were so many books selling us 
you know, boys' own manuals, the, um, you know, Eagle, things like that, saying boarding school, they'd have these little comics about boarding school's amazing. So I wanted to go. I wanted to get away from home. So 11 years old, I got there. First three weeks were great. It was like, yes. And then my mother didn't come at leave day, the exiat, to pick me up because her car had broken down. Suddenly I'm stuck in this school, nobody there. <laughs> and it's like, it's a bit like seeing Disneyland, but from the inside. So you can see all the workings and suddenly it was like, oh, this feels really scary actually. I've been so busy on the treadmill and I was suddenly after three weeks, it was like, oh, it was at that point. And you talk about that a bit in your book that it's not necessarily the first term, but sometimes the second term or the, and that was me after three weeks, like, I want to go. But it's like, oh, I can't, I can't now. And, um, and I think, yeah. So interesting with my clients, I often, they often come back to that first day of that was the most challenging, especially of six or eight. Um, but yeah. So for me, it was more after three weeks, suddenly it was like, oh, it's a shock now. I want to go, but I can't. I've said I'd be here. I've committed. So I'm... Yes, and it's like not informed consent, because I think mm -hmm. the idea that a child of 11 or younger or even older can make informed consent about something mm -hmm. like that, just because you want to go. And of course, mm -hmm. today it's Harry Potter or, you know, in the girls schools, it used to be Mallory Towers, those sort of mm -hmm. very exciting midnight feast sort of things. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, it sounded great. So people would want to go and then the reality hits and it's nothing like you imagined in all those stories. They don't have broomsticks. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think as I read Harry Potter around the time I was reading the making of them, uh, I was crying because I'm like, wait a minute, Harry Potter is totally vilified on the third year or the fourth year. They, no one will speak to him. It's three or four months. And it's like, hey, <laughs> that's... You know, and I could resonate with that being at school and yeah. So, so, so yes. Yeah, so yeah, I can really so resonate. I think, I think what you're talking about is captivity. And that's one of the things like, I, I think you've heard me talk about the ABCD mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. And of course, captivity is the C. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what you're talking about is that awful sense that you can't escape. And in the book, I write about a woman who, as a little girl at school, thought she'd just leave. Mm -hmm. And she had a school she could walk out of. Mm -hmm. And she did uh, with her friend. They just walked off and they were caught. And they, the, well, what happened is they walked and they walked and they walked and the police came along. Eventually, two little girls walking in the dark. Uh, they were 13, I think, and said, where are you going? And the friend said, we're running away. And my my patient thought, oh dear, I could, she, she would have said something a bit more sensible. <laughs> anyway, they, so they were picked up, taken back to school, and they were put into Coventry, sent to Coventry for, uh, you know, several weeks. The other children wouldn't talk to them because it had been on a sports day or some event, so that everything had had to stop for these two girls that had gone missing. And it's that sort of institutional thing you come up against, I think is, it's like the invisible walls, the real walls, but also the invisible walls and what you're talking about is captivity. It's realizing mm. you voluntarily went in, you went in voluntarily, mm. and then you're unable to go. Mm. You mm. have to conform. Yeah. It, you mentioned that in the book, or I might have been on the interview about prison. And it was like, I've not heard that before. And I'm like, yeah, it was a prison. Because I heard the same stories. People would run away. And who would bring them back? The parents. It's like, well, I can't run away. I can't ask to leave. Because if you ask to leave, they'll say, well, it's homesickness. So, <laughs> yeah, It's a homesickness that um, under, um, what's the word? Because I, I, again, I don't, I, homesickness, of course, is sickness for home, but mm -hmm. actually it's bereavement. Mm -hmm. That's me. Um, we're going kind of going backwards. The A is, <laughs> is, is bereavement because the child in boarding school is bereaved. <clears throat> mm -hmm. They've lost everything. Mm -hmm. And I guess even if you didn't get on with your father, 
you probably missed him or you missed your home, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Most people do. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone. I mean, I have to say, some of the people I interviewed and some of my colleagues and some of my family, actually, who went to boarding school, said, it, you know, they, the, the good outweighed the bad. They, you know, there, was, there were losses. But for some people, boarding school is better than their home. Mm -hmm. And for some people, they adapt. Maybe they're resilient in a different way than other people. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people in boarding school come from families that are not um, emotionally uh, connected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the traditional stiff upper lip mm -hmm. means that, you know, well, I, I went to boarding school and didn't do me any harm. And, you know, that whole thing about the making of them, that phrase. Mm. Um, and it's passed through the generations. So you can't make a fuss. Mm. 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 So what's then A, if we're going? Backwards. Backwards. <laughs> A is abandonment. A is the moment of abandonment. A is that first day. Mm. It's that realization like for a child like you who <clears throat> well you, maybe not you because you said it was all right for three weeks mm -hmm. but a lot of children like Roald Dahl writes about it Andrew Motion I quote them in the book mm -hmm. um, and a number of other people write about that first day like they're going off to boarding school or like my patient I was talking about mm -hmm. they're told it's great and then just that moment when like one of my patients described it as noticing the wheels of the car of his parent his parents car were turning mm. and suddenly they were going and they were really leaving him there and so many people um talk about different ways of being abandoned in the school like a lot of the schools didn't want the child to make a fuss so they told the parents to just disappear you know the child go off and do so and so and when the child comes back its parents aren't there anymore um and so that is the first betrayal. It's the moment of abandonment. But what I talk about with that is, as you uh, said just now, is that it's not always the first week or two or first term, but the second term, because you go back again, you've been home. And then you realize, oh my goodness, this is going to go on. And for a child, a term, three months is forever. Mm -hmm. And a year is, you know, I. I can remember it, I'm sure you can as a child. The eternity of a year, it's like there is no end to it. And mm. um, so the child is in this space and has to get just get on with it. Mm. And it's just getting on with it. It's a stiff mm. lip thing. <clears throat> yeah. But deep down they feel abandoned. And when we work in therapy with people, that is what sometimes comes out. Mm. You know, how could their parents have left them? How could they have done that? Mm. You know, as parents, the most precious thing in our lives is our children. Mm. You know, the last thing you would do is leave them with strangers. Exactly. We warn them of stranger danger all the time. <clears throat> yeah. And they are exposed to unknown strangers, people the parents have met maybe once, twice. Mm. Mm. And... Um, and Andrew Motion writes about, actually, the headmaster was a friend of his family. But as mm. soon as the family had gone, they were beaten. He grew special canes in the garden for whipping the boys. Um, and this was someone that was known to the parents. But So it's trusting strangers with your children who do sexually abuse them. And we know a lot about that now. Mm. Um, mm. Alex Renton was talking with you about that but yeah. increasingly with the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse you know the stuff that's coming out now is is huge and mm. shocking yeah 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 mm. Mm. thank you thank you Joy I had something that came into my mind and like a cloud it floated by so we'll move on to a, the next question <laughs> thank you um so the first question I have um, is to do with, I mean, I can read it out and maybe you can, um, it says, I find that when I'm most, um, when I am at my most in need, i.e. ill or struggling with something really difficult, I will shut out everyone around me and just put my head down and get through it. Friends and family feel pushed away. 
but it's the only way I know how to deal with hard situations. I then feel so alone and tired. How can I let people back in at my moments of need? Great question. Oh, that's so difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's not a cognitive thing. <clears throat> you know, he, he or she probably really wants to let people in. But it's like emotionally, it's something so closed because because when you're a child and you can't reach out to adults when you're at your most low it's really hard and so i suppose i mean each person is different it's very hard to say for one person you know how they can do it but i think it's recognizing that this is historical it's not now it's something that did happen to you but it's not going on now the people in your life now care about you but it's so risky to let people care i think that's the thing it's so painfully risky and it's so it's not a conscious thing it's so deep that um because if it's conscious you can sort of say well i'm not going to do this anymore <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but it's it's like <clears throat> trying to release yourself from that old terror really mm -hmm. The terror of being loved, mm. because, you know, you cannot trust people to love you if the people who you, who were supposed to love you abandon you. Makes it very hard. Mm. What do you feel we can do? Um, I know that that was something I really struggled with until the last few years, especially around friendships for me. Um, you know, as I was sharing in the interview, one of my friends killed himself at school. And that meant I just couldn't trust people. I've kind of learned now to start to cultivate friendships. But what would you say has really helped your clients to, to be able to move through that, to let people back in? You know, some, it's different with everybody. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's having a conversation with your parents. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're lucky enough to have parents who are still alive and who are open to talk to you because very few parents can bear to talk about this because it's so painful for them because mm. they can't go back and undo it. But if you can have that conversation with your parents, that, that is sometimes wonderful, mm. it's a release because that can be emotional for both people. But that's very rare. The other thing is perhaps to allow yourself to forgive and uh, you, it, sometimes you can't forgive your parents for doing it to you, but if you can forgive yourself and realize that you weren't a bad person, mm. because so many people feel, I must have been bad. The reason I was sent away was because I was, even if it's not conscious, it's like they'd have kept me at home if, if, um, if I'd been, if I'd been lovable. Mm. So it's, again, it's realizing that's an old script and kind of, it is hard to do that without help, but with therapy, mm. and, you know, I think that helps mm. or other ways of doing it. I mean, there may be, you know, people follow other paths, but mm. it is facing it really and realizing it's not now, it was then. Mm, that's really useful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, Another question I have is someone asking about that. I would love to know more about the split self that happens when you go to boarding school at a young age. How does it manifest through life? There's a few questions here. How can we recognize it's there and what healing work can a person do to reunite all aspects of themselves? So. My God, how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah. a big one. Um, it is. So. Um, well, I mean, one of the things I talk a lot about these days and is the whole thing about sexuality, mm -hmm. that very often people's love life is very split off, mm -hmm. um, that, so that the manifestation of that being abandoned by, very often it's the mother, the person that, um, the primary carer, which is often the mother. Mm. And the sense that that person could abandon you 
means it's very hard to trust people who love you when you're an adult. Um, and so it's very hard to invest everything in one person. So a lot of people find all sorts of ways of having secret affairs or um, split off relationships in all sorts of ways or keeping a very private life, um, like work life and home life very separate. Um, there are so many ways that people that manifest for people. <coughs> um, and then the question was, yes, yeah, so how does it manifest through life? Well, uh, yes, in all sorts of ways. Um, it can be kind of cutting off from relationships when they're at their most intimate. So a lot of people who went to boarding school find it very hard to talk about their feelings, um, to be in touch with the softer side of themselves. It's very hard for women who went to boarding school because also because, um, you know, we we often talk about men, but, but with women it's, it's similar, but it's slightly different as well. It, I think it manifests differently and girls' schools are a bit different. But um, in both cases, I think, you have to learn to cope without, um, without being vulnerable, without mm -hmm. showing you're vulnerable, without even knowing you're vulnerable. So I'm just going to try. The sun is wonderful. I don't want to shut it out, but I'm just going to try. Yes. I've just been for a walk in the sun. But, uh, it's gorgeous, isn't it? It's lovely. But it's a bit... Um, distorting I think at times at this moment um, yes so how do we heal it well by talking to people by taking the risk of trusting people um, by um, how do you re reunite it all sorts of ways people find all sorts of ways of finding themselves and, and getting themselves together. First of all, you have to recognize what, what's happened. What happened to you? And what's that done to you? And what's that done to your relationships? And can you repair those relationships? And as I said before, I don't think you can always repair the relationship with your parents, but you can within yourself. Because sometimes, if you can understand what your parents were meaning to do, not all parents mean well by sending their children to boarding school. Sometimes they're just inept. Sometimes they mean really well and they want a really good education for their child. And if it's possible to forgive the parent or to understand that the parent, you know, you were maybe eight, the mm -hmm. parent was in their late 20s or 30s, you know, the parent was also finding their way in the world. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there's all, all kinds of... Um, but for different people, it's different. So I can't really answer that question. I think I'm waffling a bit. No, that's uh, thank you. That that makes sense to me. So thank you, Joy. So the next question, number six, the question's quite in your face, but I do remember actually. Um, I think it was in. Uh, I think it was this article here in the Journal of Analytical Psychology, two thousand and four. The one, the question is, um, so these are all from um, ex-boarders. So should boarding in pre-teens be defined as child abuse? And I know you, you mentioned that in, in there. Yes, that was um, pointed out to me by uh, a, a Dutch friend who said, well, of course, the British, the British elite are all, um, they're the... Um, how did she put it? I can't remember. It's in the article, isn't it? But they're basically a, a nation of, of people who've been abused as mm -hmm. children. Um, I think it's a bit strong to say it's child abuse, although I would really encourage parents not to send their children. <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. it's it can be child abuse, and it very often used to be child abuse because mm -hmm. as soon as the child arrived, they'd have something thrown at them or they'd be uh, beaten in some cases. I mean, you know, people would arrive in the school and the first night everyone in the dormitory would be beaten, you mm -hmm. know, um, by, by the staff. Um, mm -hmm. 
and or by other students mm -hmm. with the staff condoning it. So in that case, it is actually leaving a child in a situation where they're open to be abused. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I don't know who the abuser is if you actually say it's defined as child abuse because I, there are occasions when, as I said, when sometimes a child, you know, it's a better, a better option mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I mean, so I've said it myself. I've called it child abuse, mm -hmm. um, and I think it, in some ways, is. Um, mm -hmm. mm. I, I liked what you said in in the book just about children in care. That really was like, oh wow! Of course, boarding schools, children in care. Yes, that's a bit I wanted to come back to because I think that is um, that is really important because mm. um, I yes I said that in the book and I wrote about it in that article in 2011 that I published and um, the media picked up on that and just mm. ran with it. I was really surprised because most times the normal everyday journalists do not read uh, the British Journal of Psychotherapy, mm. but. On this occasion, they picked up on the idea that that children in boarding school are actually looked after children. Mm. They are just the same as children in care. The difference is the parents pay for it, and the parents um, really choose it for their children. Whereas very often, children in care, the parents are fighting like mad to get their children back. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so it it and it is compar comparable because. You're in a, a place looked after by strangers, mm -hmm. at, the, at the mercy of those strangers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's kind of, I almost feel it's like abdication because you have one teacher, say housemaster, for 50 boys or who's yeah. on duty. I mean, how can they really give duty of care? Well, that's right. And sometimes those house parents can be a couple and they can be kind. Mm. And sometimes they're, they're the sort of people that you would never trust your child to live mm. with. Mm. Yeah, and, and you're right, 50, 50 children and of the same sex. I mean, mm. so now there is mixed. There's another set of problems because a lot mm. of the schools are mixed. Mm. And um, there's a lot of pressure on children and particularly girls sexually, you know, to mm. perform, to be seen as attractive, to, to compete. Uh, so that is another set of problems for teenagers. And of course, you know, growing up, adolescence in a boarding school is not an ideal situation, to put it mildly. <laughs> it's single sex, it's kind of crazy, um, mm. and it distorts people's perception, perceptions. So boys' schools, you know, it distorts their perception of women. Mm. And mm. it's very often the bravado is, you know, anything feminine or to do with women or mothers is is you know or certainly was i don't know if it is today still um was to be thought of as well soft mm -hmm. uh, all, all the words that you would use yeah. in a kind of abusive or a, a yeah. denigrating way ours was gay if you were anyway feminine soft you know you cried you're gay you know, give you some, give someone a hug. You'll get, you know. So, yes, that was our our word in our school, and that was the yeah. worst insult ever. And through seven years, nobody came out as being gay while I was at school. No one. And but it's like, no. But I bet you that what <laughs> what what happens then? I don't mean about your school necessarily, mm. but what happens then is a lot of those people continue. We were talking about the split earlier. Mm, they mm. continue to have a split off homosexual life while being married, mm, that mm. kind of thing, because um, it continues to be rather exciting because sexual experiments between boys in some schools are tacitly permitted, in other schools are absolutely forbidden. Mm, mm. Either way, I think it becomes, there's nobody else in a single sex school. You have crushes on people of the same sex because that's what's mm. available. Mm, 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 mm. yeah yeah i'd love to go off on a tangent here about archetypes and the the lover archetype because that fascinates me this is an idea i've been coming up with recently is i feel 
almost at boarding school, we suppress that part of ourselves, that lover, the spontaneous, the joyful, wanting to connect with others. And I really see that often in the work I do with men, that's the area ex-boarders struggle with the most is that lover quadrant. So, um, yes, that's, yes, to be seen as loving is a terrible um, <clears throat> weakness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To miss mummy, it's like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's... well, because of, of course, if one child does, all of them will fall apart. Yeah, yeah. And that's the trouble. And that's why the vulnerable get punished. Mm. And that brings us to neatly to our political situation. Yes, please. Do we, I realise we've only got eight minutes left. I probably could speak for hours. So, <laughs> um, yes, please speak about the political situation. Well, it's just that if people have grown up in that situation where they mustn't show empathy for others, it's mm. very difficult to... Um, and also, you know, those who are in power, those who get into positions in government, I mean, Nick's written about it, and so has Robert Beckett. Um, they've written quite a lot about government and, and politics. And I'm, you know, it's not my thing, really, but it's very obvious that the, um, the government we have now and have had always really has been a huge percentage of people who went to the top public schools and you it's very hard to find policies are made i think without understanding what it's like not to have mm -hmm. and to be even if there's a cognitive understanding perhaps a little bit you know of trying to be equal in society um the vulnerable suffer hugely and are at the moment for example with the pandemic suffering mm. much more than than other people you know with the, the imbalance the the split in our society is huge and the public schools contribute to that i think mm. Mm. yeah yeah i could go off on another tangent about prisons and i'm wondering maybe more from a jungian perspective i think jung said something that when we don't make the unconscious conscious it turns up in our life and we call it fate and i'm wondering with the idea that boarding school was prison how much of what we're seeing with decision making etc in in politics at the moment is an externalizing of that external internal suffering and being projected outwards uh, that's interesting i nearly got connected up with the first part of what you were saying very much um but i've lost it now um <laughs> no worries but yes i mean yes we could go we could go off on a tangent here i think but i think it would take another hour probably <laughs> yeah 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 that's what i said that someone said to me when i said i'd interviewing you they said you'll have no problem talking <laughs> to her and I was like, yes, yes, I will. I have to keep focused. So um, maybe the kind of finishing uh, today off um, is just that question seven about what is your point of view on what recovery looks like after boarding school? Um, well, perhaps we're talking about people, I, I can really only talk about people who go into therapy and come out the other side, I mm. suppose, mm. Um, having taken the brave, absolutely courageous step to do that, because mm. I don't underestimate how terrible, terribly painful it is to face what you've suffered when you were a child and you were traumatised because, you know, it's multiple traumas, these schools. The, you know, there's the bullying, there's there's the initial abandonment, and then there's the bullying that happens later, you know, for many people, the kind of sense of imprisonment, and all of that is kind of, can drive you, and can make you so angry. And it's something about letting up on the anger, being able to kind of just, but that takes time. 
but coming out the other side is like oh yes okay like the person who asked you know who said how the question was um shutting people out mm. when they're, they're most vulnerable often there's a lot of anger behind that you know which is unconsciously you weren't there when i needed you and now you know you want to help me but no way and there's something about the intense anger which keeps people shut in. Mm -hmm. And in therapy, one of the difficult things is to confront the anger and allow people to confront their anger. Because mm -hmm. often then it can be, they can be angry with the therapist in the session. Mm -hmm. um, and they can be, and they need to, because that, that's how we come alive. You know, it's what Jung called the shadow. Mm -hmm. You can't just get by and through it by being nice you know the anger and the distress at having a, a, a what happened to you at those unjust people that threw things at you you know teachers that came by with a ruler and clipped you you know or mm. or much worse as i talk about in the book you know punch mm. you in the face um and which those of you who've been to boarding school know about mm. which i didn't have to suffer i went to a day school you know and however hideous those um teachers were i could get away from them at night and i could throw my uniform off mm. and that's what can't be done in boarding school and so many people are not able to have you don't have reverie in boarding school so one of the things when you're an adult that we try and get to a point where people can allow themselves to have reverie i mean sometimes you know having a bath mm. you know just soaking in a bath people have been to boarding school very rarely allow themselves to do that because you know you had to be in you know three minute bath or whatever it was or cold showers every morning um that kind of space where you kind of meditate think float free float your ideas all of that um and so that's perhaps what someone looks like when they come out the other side maybe they can relax and have a bath maybe they can embrace their children and not feel the children have to do anything and maybe not feel that you have to do anything because there's also that thing about um always having to be doing something mm -hmm. there's very little in most boarding schools very little space for just wandering a lot of people talk about the grounds and finding a little space in the grounds where they go um, on their own and just maybe cry or just be there or just find little insects or you know animals or whatever it is um and that's maybe what people can allow themselves now if they but it's getting through that grief there's so much grief which i guess you know about Piers. you know, oh, you know it. yeah i felt when i was I read the book it was felt like a reservoir and a reservoir of emotions and had this dam and i cried every day i think uh for two years and i was doing recording my dreams and it was like oh but then it was like my heart felt like it was flowing again it was yes. no red dam so exactly grief but wow it was painful <laughs> at times but then you come to life because mm -hmm. the problem is that people when that's happened to you, you're not able to feel fully alive. And a lot of people who come to me say things like, it's a, like I'm walking through the world in a bubble. I'm mm. separate from the world. And mm. that happens very early on in school because you're separated from your family and you never find them again in the same way. You just don't. When you go home, you've had experiences you can't convey to them. Mm. And that's a tragedy, really. That's the mm. tragedy of it. One mm. of the many. Mm. Mm. I do get very angry about it, as you can see. <laughs> yeah, and and me too. I'm just reading and listening to your um, your interviews. You know, part of me's, you know, as I my book's almost ready. It's like right, it has to go out there. I have to share that uh, we have to share our journeys. Absolutely. Um, I so look forward to reading that. <laughs> It's been many tears again, but uh, <laughs> to, to write it, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's was... testimony though, isn't it? It's witness testimony. That's what you're doing. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Mm, so I see we're at five o'clock and I still have lots more questions, but I just like to just move to the last question about how do people get in touch with you um, or, you know, maybe resources or books or where you would direct people? Um, well, that's my website, which um, is uh, joyshaffron.com. Mm -hmm. Um, but also the books. So, um, yeah, so the, the books are available. Um, well, the usual places, really. Mm. Um, I mean, if anyone wants to write to me, and uh, I mean, uh, I can't do them per cheaper than I don't think than Amazon or something like that. Mm. But mm. I can send them to people if they want to pay postage, but you can get them on Amazon. So, um, yeah, so my books, Nick Duffel's books, Robert Vercake, there are quite a lot now. Mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. and boarding school survivors support is a also an organization which helps ex-boarders and has loads of resources there mm -hmm. okay thank you that's excellent so yes if you've not bought a copy um then i do recommend uh, reading this it is yeah very insightful so thank you so thank you so much for your time today joy um could have asked so many more questions but i really appreciate you taking your time out of the day to to speak with me um and yeah again just thank you so much for this amazing work and the courage you've done to 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 bring this to light uh, it's been such yeah such a help thank you well thank you Piers, and it's been a real pleasure talking to you you're a very easy interviewer <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you appreciate that okay bye-bye Bye.